Voyeurs of Reddit, what was your hold it? Moment where you knew you would win? Story one. So I filed the lawsuit in January. We exchanged discovery. Each side sends questionnaires and gets carefully worded answers. Over the next few months, and I file a motion for summary judgment, meaning I'm asking the court to let me win the case without a jury because the case is so obvious. Right before I file this motion, I figure let's review the discovery materials and see if there's anything I missed. And what do you know the other side made a massive mistake on literally just the fourth out of 100 plus questions that I asked? It's a dog bite case. And every single time I asked about the bite, the response says something along the lines of, we admit to this and that, but we deny that our dog was involved in any dog attack. Well, question four asks whether they admit that their dog was not leashed on the day when it bit my client, and they simply answer, admit. Meaning, they admit their dog was not leashed, and they admit that their dog was the one that bit my client. That was the one thing that was genuinely in dispute. They tried to argue at the hearing that it was a mistake, and they only meant to admit to the lack of a leash. But the judge held them to their word, most likely because the other evidence made it clear it could only have been their dog anyway. Edit. For everyone hating on this for being misleading, and the reason everyone hates lawyers, I'll clarify that at the time I wrote the questions, I would not have dreamed that they would have the balls to deny their dog's involvement. Their dog obviously was the one that did it. They let their dog out every day, no leash, and it terrorized the neighborhood for months, terminating chickens, fighting with people's dogs, chasing cars, before it finally bit my client. It was the only dog that ever did this. And yet the insurance company tried to lowball my clients and refused to even cover their medical bills. So after two years of negotiating, they finally lawyered up. Story 2. Plaintiff's attorney forgets to send notice to my client to testify. Can't make $1.35k case with his witness. Get smacked down for not knowing local rules. I did a quid pro quo case for a guy who was doing my firm's website. It was a breach of contract case for a credit card. The debt had been sold, and at the time of trial, the ad danum was something like $1.35k. The client brought me in late in the game. He's already gone to mandatory arbitration and lost. I get the case a week before the bench trial, and when going through the pleadings, etc., I realize that the plaintiff never sent a 237 notice. This is when one side tells the other that they need to make available either tangible evidence or a party witness at trial. Think subpoena, but less bite. So the plaintiff forgot to send this notice to the defendant that he needed to appear at the trial. Normally, if a defendant doesn't appear at a civil trial, you get the obvious. The judge only hears one side of the story and Deef loses. When a 237 is given and the defendant doesn't show, the judge is supposed to infer that DF didn't show because his testimony would have hurt his case. Negative inference. But because this was a debt buyer, plaintiff had no actual knowledge that this credit card bill and charges belonged to my client. All they get is a single page print out from the original debt holder saying they sold this debt, and if they're lucky, some copies of statements. They could easily have proven it by calling my guy as a witness. Even if client denies charges, plaintiff can make a good case because defendant's name is on the bill. It's to his address. The restaurant charges are for the sub shop on his block, etc. And all that would come out when they're called deaf as a witness. So I tell my guy, wait down the street. We do pre-trial motions and plaintiff asks for my client. I point out their procedural error and they panic. They put on their witness, who is some account rep at the debt buyer, and I object to hearsay on everything they try to get in. She has no knowledge, can't lay foundation for statements, and the only thing she can remotely testify to is her own business record. The single page showing a debt sale. Not enough. Then plaintiff attorney gets a bright idea. He starts to ask his witness about the arbitration hearing. I see where he's going and let it play out a bit. He's trying to get in an admission of party opponent. Basically, witness can say that at the arbitration hearing, my client admitted this was his debt. But this is an out-of-town attorney. He doesn't realize that because arbitration is mandatory and has very relaxed evidentiary rules, all evidence comes in if you tell the other side what you're going to use, that this county considers arbitrations to be the equivalent of settlement conferences and the testimony isn't admissible at trial except to impeach. Result. Directed finding for my client, who saved himself a $35,000 judgment. Judge praises my defense and I get to make super fake small talk in the tiny elevator with the plaintiff and his witness after trial, where I walk out to hand my client the court order in his favor. Most satisfying win ever. Story 3. I knew the cops beat up my client and framed him. They described a knife in his possession that caused them to fear for their safety. Oddly, they never seized it. We won the criminal case and filed a civil rights case. While deposing one, he described the knife in detail. No more than three minutes later, he slipped up and claimed his partner told him my guy had a knife, but he never saw it himself. I told him, that's not what you just said, and saw him panic. His lawyer panicked too and asked to see me outside. 
When we got in the hallway, I withdrew my settlement demand, and the case settled for a substantially larger amount within 45 minutes. Story 4. Moments like this usually happen at bond hearings for me. It almost never fails. If the judge starts by saying something good for our side, he's going to deny bond 9 times out of 10. But if the judge starts by saying things like how these are some serious allegations, and although he's not prejudging the case, there seem to have been some bad decisions made, etc. That's usually just the judge trying to put the fear of God in the defendant before granting bond so he'll behave while out on bond. Story 5. I had a client who was accused of taking a young woman's car and then crashing it fleeing the scene. The girl testified at trial that she had given him the keys that night because she was drunk and would never, ever drink and drive. Apparently, she was not aware that I had requested and obtained a copy of her driving record, which showed she received a DUI a month after the incident. I still remember the look on her face when I handed her driving record to her and said, except for that one time you got caught a month later, right? The look on the judge's face was equally memorable. Story 6. While I'm a lawyer, I was observing this occur. There was a moment during cross-exam I knew the defendant won, and it was absolutely lost on the witness. The defendant was given a ticket for not placing a flag on ladder that was extending beyond the bumper. The law said that there had to be a flag at the end, usually a tied rag or something, of an item being transported if the item extends four feet beyond the back of the vehicle. The officer testified that he pulled the truck over, driven by the defendant. The officer measured the length the ladder was hanging over the tailgate with a tape measure, which was four feet and a couple of inches or so. There was no flag. The prosecutor had no further questions, and the defendant, who was a painter by trade, not a lawyer, did a brilliant cross. The tailgate was closed, so the ladder was hanging over the tailgate at an angle. The tops of the ladder was lower than the bottom of the ladder, which was hanging over the tailgate. The defendant asked the officer at what degree the ladder was to the bed of the truck. The officer did not know, but estimated 30 degrees. The defendant asked the officer to do trigonometry on the stand to calculate how many feet the ladder extended linear to the bed of the truck. The officer was not understanding that while the ladder was four feet and change over the tailgate, the angle the ladder was sitting made is under four linear feet away from the back of the truck, which was the law. The officer kept arguing with the defendant. The judge finally stepped in, said that the state had failed to meet its burden of proof because there was no proof the ladder extended four linear feet behind the truck was absolutely brilliant defense. The officer had to be shown a diagram explaining why he was wrong to give a ticket. Story 7. My brother went to court to gain some custody rights of his daughter. Ex-wife says he shouldn't be allowed to be alone with the daughter because he looks at prohibited photos. The judge, who happened to be a woman, laughed and said, Honey, if every man who looked at prohibited photos wasn't allowed to see their children, then there would be no child with a daddy in this world. Story 8. It was day two of a child custody modification trial. The opposition and her attorney were and are crazy. Their allegations were so weak that I told my guy, fudge it, let's go for custody ourselves. I'm cross-examining mom about her proposed custody plan for dad in some detail. And I ask her, would you accept this for yourself? She snaps back, absolutely not. I ask, why not? Because I'm a mother. To his credit, my guy kept a straight face the entire trial and never once got pissy. Her petition was denied outright. Our was accepted by the court. If the mom or her lawyer hadn't been such pains to deal with, my guy probably would have agreed to some small reductions in his custody just to keep the peace. Instead, the judge gave us nearly everything we asked for. Story 9. Man, I'm always too late, but I've got a good one. When I was interning at the criminal court for a judge, I observed a pre-trial hearing for a murder case. The defendant allegedly disappeared his grandmother because she wouldn't give him money, then stuffed her in a closet and called a hooker for close relationship in the bed right next to the closet. Horrifying stuff. During the hearing, the defendant's lawyer, prosecutor, and judge went through some typical procedures. Then the judge asked the defendant if he had anything to add. The defendant smugly said yes, actually. I don't think I'm intellectually fit to stand trial according to Article X under the criminal procedure. The judge let him finish, looked him dead in the eye, and said, The fact that you just told me this shows you're perfectly fit to stand trial. Story 10. I was an attorney for an insurance company defending a lawsuit where the plaintiffs were two girls who claimed they were irreparably harmed and their lives would never be the same because severe back injuries kept them from being active. They forgot to set their Instagram accounts to private and the accounts were full of pictures of them riding jet skis, dancing, and pictures of them at the gym. The underage drinking pictures were just icing on the cake. Story 11. In a gun possession trial, the defendant, his mom, his sister, and his friend all said the gun was in a bag that belonged to the defendant's dead father. The father had passed away three years before the arrest. 
I looked at the bag and noticed it had a date on it after the dad's death. It was an Under Armour bag. We contacted Under Armour. They sent a rep to us. When it was our turn to rebut UA rep testifies, we didn't start making that bag until two months before the arrest. Defendant already testified everything else in the car was his aside from the bag and gun. The other was shooting case and it was not my aha moment, but the defendant's. Reading potential witness list before jury selection and come to a name. Defense attorney. Who is that? My response. The guy in the elevator that took off right after your client himself. We had grainy video of Ehep, she turns to her client. Then to the judge. Does the court's offer still stand? Defendant wants to take the court's offer. I also had a guy plead guilty when we disclosed his phone calls from jail, begging his witnesses to lie for him. Story 12. I'm a DUI prosecutor. I was doing a DUI jury trial. Alcohol. The trial had gone well, and I expected we would probably get guilty verdicts. The defense attorney was all over the place. The officer had also found marijuana and a pipe with residue in the defendant's car. But we didn't want to bring it in because the defendant didn't appear to be impaired by the marijuana. We only had a blood alcohol test, and it could have been prejudicial and honestly just wasn't worth the headache to fight over it. In closing argument, in an attempt to call out the shoddy investigation of my officer, the defense attorney all but screamed, And you know... The officer actually found marijuana in the car, and he never bothered to test for it. For all he knew, my client could have been impaired by the marijuana, not the alcohol. In AZ, as in most states, you can be impaired by either alcohol or any can. Even the judge broke the fourth wall for a moment and just stared at the defense attorney. It did not take the jury long to come back with a guilty verdict. Story 13. Client was charged with assaulting his ex-girlfriend. Her story was that he nearly ran her off the road. He opened her door and started punching her. His story was the opposite that she nearly ran him off the road and started punching him through his window. U.S. so driver on left side. We get to trial and she describes all these injuries, but doesn't have any pictures of anything with her. I ask the stupid question, well, if you were so injured, where are the pictures? On my phone. Fudge. She shows all the pictures, which shows bruises up and down her right arm, split knuckles on right hand, cuts on right wrist, etc. Nothing on her left side or face or body. I didn't take pictures of those injuries, she said. Hold it! Took the judge about 30 seconds to rule not guilty. The evidence supported my guy's story 100%. Story 14. Former prosecutor here. We had a defendant on trial for DUI. We had already completed jury selection, and one witness had testified when we broke for lunch. Our witness coordinator, who was sitting in the back of the courtroom, said she thought our defendant looked impaired during the morning proceedings, fumbling with her purse, falling asleep, etc. So we mentioned it to an officer who followed her out of the parking lot straight to the liquor store a mile from the courthouse. She got back in her car 10 minutes, and this time, when driving back to court, she was weaving and driving 15 below the speed limit, which was only 30 mf, so already pretty slow. She didn't respond to the lights and just moseyed on into the parking lot, parked weird, and was eventually contacted. Jurors were coming back to the courthouse while officers had her perform roadside maneuvers. She was promptly arrested. Her attorney tried to a deal right there, but we politely declined, and the judge declared a mistrial since the defendant could not be present to assist in her defense. Story 15. Not lawyer, but represented myself in court. Got a parking ticket and contested it due to misleading signs. Took a bunch of pictures and brought it to court. Judge agreed and dismissed the case. Hold up! What about the towing fees, I asked, as he was about to read the next case. Got those back, too. Story 16. Okay, another custody trial. It's worthy to note that the opposition was pro se, representing herself. Otherwise, this never would have made it to trial. Judge, how long do you need to present your case and or KCMO? Me, I'll need about 15 minutes, Your Honor. Then you're going to rule for my client. Judge, laughing, you're pretty sure of yourself there, Counselor. Me, I have pictures of the respondent doing sweets in a crack house, Judge. Judge, call your first witness. Me, I call the respondent, who promptly started to ugly cry. Story 17, back before we were lawyers ourselves, my law school classmate got to take lead on a case under the supervision of a public defender. I think it was over a car being stolen, but I'm only about 90% sure. The lady whose car was stolen, or whatever it was, had previously said that it was definitely the person who was there as the defendant. I was observing because it was cool that he got this opportunity. And it got even cooler when the plaintiff was on the stand and responded to, Do you see the person that stole the car or whatever here today? With no, the defendant was clearly within her field of vision, and yet she said she didn't see the perpetrator, so the case was now a slam dunk. There was that moment where my classmates and I just looked at each other like, did she really just say that? My friend got to give the closing argument and everything. I thought it was pretty neat. Story 18. Not a lawyer, but represented myself in small claims court. I bought a motorcycle while working overseas in Afghanistan. 
I had my brother-in-law pick it up with his trailer, hand over the cash, and get a bill of sale for me. I came back home a week later, so I was able to have all the paperwork for the DMV in my name. Anyway, in NY State, you can sell a vehicle that has a lion on it with a lion release. In NJ where I lived, you just can't do that and need to get a new title with no lion on it. A lion release letter didn't matter. Well, this one was the original title from a decade and a half previous, which had a lion on it from the credit union that loaned the money to the original owner to finance the motorcycle. It was paid off, so I just needed a new title without the lion on it so I could transfer the title and register it in my name. The problem was that the credit union had been absorbed by another regional bank, and they couldn't provide the new title to me because I wasn't the borrower. They could only provide a lion release form, but that didn't matter to NJ. It made sense because I didn't have the business with them. So I go back to the owner and ask them to please get a new title without a lion on it. This dude sends me the lion release and I told him again, I needed the new title, not a lion release. Phone calls and emails go back and forth for nine months until his GF, using his email, said, Jimmy said that it's your problem and he don't want nothing to do with it. I'm sorry. I told him that's not right. I responded and then got a curse word laden response from the guy himself telling me he did what he was supposed to and I needed to fudge off. So at that point, what could I do? I had the bike with insurance, but it couldn't be registered in my name without the title being in my name. I drove the 90 minutes to his hometown and filed paperwork with the clerk to sue him on small claims court. The bike cost $3,500, and the max was $3,000 in small claims court. So close enough for me. The court date approaches. I figure he wouldn't show up, but he did, and he was wearing a muscle shirt and cut-off jorts while I was wearing a shirt and tie. I present the case to the judge. This douchebag defends himself and said it was just a misunderstanding and that he didn't realize he had to get me corrected paperwork. The judge says, well, since this appears to be a misunderstanding, and that's where I interrupted him. I explained how he told me to fudge off, and he was well aware of everything I needed because as you see in these printed out emails, the highlighted parts show where I was very detailed and specific with what I needed. And the other color highlighted parts were where B acknowledged my request and told me to fudge off. The judge's face changed instantly. He changes his tone and immediately says, I rule in favor of the plaintiff for the sum of $3,000 and ownership of the bike. He then addressed me directly and said, By the looks of this guy and his address within the village, it was a trailer park. I assume he doesn't have the money, and the only way we can enforce it is to put a lion on his property, which he will never pay. What I can do is adjourn for now, and if you don't get the title two weeks from now, Call the court and the judgment will be made in your favor. Eight days later, I had a title in my hand with no lion on it, and I could finally register and ride my bike, legally, after having taken possession of it 11.5 months earlier. Maybe this belongs in our petty whatever revenge? Story 19. Civil fraud case in Silicon Valley involving software license royalties. Plaintiff's attorney. In your report to my client of the number of licenses your company sold, you reported a much lower number than you reported that you sold in your annual financial report to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Was the incorrect number reported to my client or to the SEC? Chief Accountant for Defendant, the SEC. The defendant company lost the civil case, and executives for the defendant company were later convicted in Federal Court of Criminal Securities Fraud for lying to the SEC. The execs served about six years in prison. Story 20. Not as a lawyer, but a defendant. I was a concierge and named in a lawsuit against the building by an unlicensed realtor who was barred from entry after headbutting me while he was wearing a bike helmet. He was representing himself in court. He cross-examines me over how I had barred him from entry and had some preamble about the vendetta I had against him, then asked me to repeat what I said when I asked him to leave the building. I responded, I'm sorry, was that before or after you hit me? He immediately answered, after I hit you. Took him a minute, but his face fell pretty far after he caught on to what he just admitted. Case dismissed. Edited for sentence structure and missing words. Story 21. Not a lawyer, but I entered an intersection on yellow going straight. I did not change my speed since I thought I was too close to the intersection to safely brake. In the oncoming lanes, a car waiting to turn left, thus crossing my right of way, entered the intersection on yellow, attempting to make it to the interstate in rush hour traffic before the light changed to red. A well-known long red. I saw him and swerved a bit too to avoid what I could, but he still hit me my rear driver's side, his front driver's side, and caused my side curtain airbags to deploy. To add insult to injury, the tow truck then burned my brakes because they towed my car 30 miles with my parking brake fully engaged after the accident. Other driver told the officer that he thought I was going to turn right onto the interstate, what most cars do there. But I was in the left lane, which doesn't turn right, it only goes straight. My destination was in front on me, not up the interstate. 
I didn't have a turn signal on either, so even if I was in the right lane it would have been clear that I was going straight not right. Anyway, the responding officer gave us both tickets because he said we both had a duty to stop on yellow, which is not what driver's ed taught me. Since driver's ed said you have a quick decision if you're close to the intersection and have right of way on yellow. He also orders us to both show up in traffic court. Meanwhile, we had the same insurance carrier. Insurance got statements and images from both of us and ruled that the accident was completely the other guy's fault. So he had to pay all the insurance fees and such. When I got to traffic court and the officer called my ticket before the judge and the judge asked for my plea response, I instead politely asked if I could ask a question before we begin. Judge and officer seemed surprised but agreed. I then said that there was another vehicle involved but that I hadn't seen the other driver in the courtroom yet. Judge asked if this was true. Officer checked his notes and confirmed there was a second driver. Then court confirmed the other driver was a no-show. They then did something to call for a penalty against the no-show guy. Then I said that the other driver and I had the same insurance provider and that our insurance provider had ruled the missing driver at fault and repairs to my vehicle were even underway at his expense. I had the insurance claim info with me. Judge and officer exchanged looks. Finally, I asked if, given that the insurance company got the same evidence already, decided I wasn't at fault and the other driver was missing, if they would consider dismissing the charge outright. Judge and officer chat and then tell me to sit down and that they'll return to my case a bit later in the day. Court then handles the rest of the officer's traffic cases for the morning. Officer comes over to me afterwards and says all charges are dropped as long as I don't get another ticket within six months. If I get a ticket, this case could come back for discussion. Six months pass. I call the records in court and they confirm no charges, no points on my license, and no outstanding fines. Story 22. NAL. But my dad's entire defense to why the domestic violence order against him should be dropped was, but I'm physically disabled and I need the house more than my ex-wife. He has arthritis. Except he'd already intimidated my sister in the courtroom. The duress alarm was pressed by the judge. He'd admitted to police he planned on burning the house down with our dogs inside. The DVO was for emotional abuse, and he yelled at the judge multiple times. Mom got an indefinite DVO against him. Story 23. Not a lawyer, but I got sued by my landlord for damages to a home. I showed up with my lawyer. She showed up with her manager and some floorboards that were warped from water. My lawyer asked her when I moved out. She said I was off the lease two months before it ended, leaving only my roommates there. When the water damages got brought up, we showed her pictures of a text conversation of us reporting a leak from the back door. She sent a guy who looked at it and told us he needed a sill and never came back. When she questioned me why we didn't keep up with her, I told her, I go to school and work 45 hours a week. I had already reported it and just cleaned it up when I could. Funny part is they redid the floors with new flooring, more expensive, and they also added gutters to the house. My lawyer asked her why she added gutters to the house? Probably because that was what was needed to stop the flipping rain from ultimately piling up behind the back door. Yeah, I offered to settle the 3,600 suit for $600 bucks. She said no. Judge dismissed the case and she cried LOL. Story 24. Attorney here. Here's a short one that happened two or three weeks ago. In a response to a motion to dismiss on some large litigation for a corporation dumping toxic chemicals, the attorney, probably intern, who wrote the response brief, accidentally attached the wrong document as evidence. Instead of something or another that would vaguely work as a defense to the motion, they irrevocably proved our side of the case true with some ownership documents for property in a trust. It gets better, though, because we had no idea these papers existed, and if their attorneys the client wanted to hide it during discovery, it was entirely possible we would have never found out about this stuff. Story 25. I represented myself as a 17-year-old kid in traffic court contested the ticket hoping for the cop won't show for the court date and they'll throw it out trick ticket was for tailgating following too closely while executing a left-hand turn at a light cop showed for court date oh cow judge called me up and cop is on the witness stand cop starts giving testimony sounding super official because he's a cop times of day badge numbers road conditions says my speed was approximately 12 miles per hour point of view angles Recollections of questions to and answers from the drive. Floaty head surreal out of body type feeling ensues as nerves kick in and I have no idea what I'm doing. Judge thanks officer professionalism for his testimony and asks if I have any questions for the officer. Uh, oh cow, I have to talk. I ask, how fast was the car in front of me going? He answers, approximately 15 miles per hour. Head rush. I've got this. Your honor, how could I follow too closely a car that was moving faster than I was and therefore pulling away from me? Judge laughed, thanked me for taking the time to represent myself 
and thanked me for respecting his courtroom. I had dressed really fancy for a 17-year-old. I think a suit left over from my grandpa's funeral. Judge threw out the case and dismissed us both. Cop walks out from a side door as I walk out of the courtroom, totally expecting him to be a banana. He shook my hand and thanked me for keeping him on his toes, told me I did a good job. Story 26. This was actually fairly recent. I was in a deposition of a fact witness to an automobile accident in which my client was terminated. The defendant's attorney had called the deposition and over the course of an hour and a half or so elicited a lot of testimony, which seemed to place my client partially at fault, which would impact my client's, edit, financial recovery. After sitting quietly for an hour and a half, I asked less than a dozen questions, the last of which was about the specific location of my client when he had first seen them. Based on his answer, it was clear that my client couldn't possibly be at fault. I sent a follow-up letter that same day, and the case had settled within the next two weeks. Story 27. Not a lawyer, but a client. In my divorce trial, my ex-wife has spent about two hours explaining to the court what a POS I was and all the horrible things I had done to her and my children and that I was unfit to be a parent. Two solid hours. Lie upon lie. Just six months earlier, my wife had snuck into my house. She's the one who moved out and went on my computer to type me a love letter. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're such an amazing father, great provider, great husband. You've done so much for the community. Please don't leave me. That's the gist of it. Well, she didn't print it or sign. It was just a file on my computer left on the screen for me to find. So our challenge, after all her testimony to the contrary, get her to admit she wrote this letter. I told my attorney, ask her. She won't be able to lie if she's sworn in. Plus, she's going to feel incredibly guilty about all these lies. So he handed her a printout. He had one too. He started reading it. He asked her, continue the reading. She started to cry. He asked her, do you remember writing this letter? Her face was shriveling. She looked at her attorney and said, I'm sorry, Sandy, her attorney's first name. Then she looked at the courtroom and said, Yes, I wrote this. There was silence for a few moments. Then the judge said, Attorneys, in my chambers, now. My attorney told me later, the judge understood that when your wife said, I'm sorry, Sandy, that meant that her attorney was aware this letter might be brought up and that she had instructed her client to lie. The judge was F-U-R-I-O-U-S. Back in the courtroom, my attorney went down the list lie by lie. Did he really do this? Did he really do that? When you say he was doing this, wasn't it really that? Etc. Then he had her read the entire letter again. After that, my divorce went from me being 12 inch away from losing all custody and relegated to supervised visits to, I got full custody. Made for TV or what? Story 28. I'm a trial lawyer. I have a ton of these. My favorite was probably a DUI where the cop was in a BWW with my client watching a fight. Like, the cop was standing at the bar in full uniform, then when my client walked by him to leave, followed him out. Client was only actually going to his car to grab his phone charger because he was going home with the bartender, like he hadn't even closed his tab yet. Cop arrested him and charged him with DUI for opening his car door, then fabricated this story for his report about how client got in car, turned it on, and began to pull out of the space to leave the parking lot. He also denied being inside the BWW, on the stand, under oath to my face. Surprise! I talked to the bartender at BWW and got the security tape. It very clearly, like surprisingly good quality, don't try to steal from a BWW, BETW, showed cop standing at the bar, watching my client walk out the front door, then follow him 30 seconds later. Parking lot cam also showed client barely touch the door handle before cop stopped him. Edit, Buffalo Wild Wings. I apologize, LOL. Edit, two. Since a lot of people are seeing this, I'll add, the cop underwent an internal review where the board determined he hadn't done anything wrong. A few months ago, he disappeared an unarmed man while on patrol. He also trains new cops now and tells young college girls he pulls over to call him Tommy. Bit of a soapbox. Cops don't need a reason to lie about what you say, do, or didn't say, do. I read hundreds of police reports. None of them are 100% honest. Cops lie under oath all the time. This story is just fun because I got to prove him wrong and save my client from a conviction. If you are stopped by a cop for any reason, make sure you know your rights. Do not offer information. Do not consent to a search. Do not have lengthy contact without a lawyer present or asking if you're under arrest. Story 29. Hope this counts. It's pretty funny. My dad is a personal attorney and used to be a judge. One time this lady was trying to defend herself in court about a DUI she received. BAC tests weren't admissible as evidence and could be challenged then. IDK about now. Saying she wasn't drunk when she crashed and damaged property. She was just avoiding a deer. They showed photos of the scene and she screamed, There it is! There's the deer I almost hit. She was pointing to a lifelike deer statue on someone's lawn triumphantly, like she had just won her case. They asked, wait, 
This deer. You said you it was in the middle of the road. This is on someone's lawn. Her. This is the one I almost hit, but it's on someone's lawn. You said the deer was in the middle of the road, and that's why you swerved and crashed to avoid it. It was in the middle of the road. It ran right out in front of me. This concrete deer ran out into the road in front of you? Yes. She did not win her case. Story 30. My client, the plaintiff, was in a huge car crash where my client's car literally caught on fire. During closing, the defense claimed that my client's shoulder spontaneously dislocated because it had done so nine years previously. Previously, the defense expert conceded there was evidence that the crash probably aggravated her shoulder. The look on the arbitrator's face was priceless during the defense closing. After the defense closing, but before my rebuttal, the arbitrator asked defense counsel so many damning questions that my rebuttal was less than five minutes and solely on damages. The judge awarded eight times the defense's last offer. I have edited for clarity. I did not realize how tough drinking wine Watching the crudes with my kids and typing out a coherent internet story was until today. Story 31. Right after I got my license but before I had a job, I volunteered in landlord-tenant court. Basically the first case I ever took to an evidentiary hearing, the landlord was trying to terminate the tenancy, meaning they didn't care if they got rent money. They just wanted the house back. The reason cited for termination was non-payment of rent. That's odd because most landlords would probably file a non-payment of rent case but it's also a lease violation, so they can legally proceed with the termination. My clients didn't want to leave. They just wanted him to fix things, so we went to trial. Losing meant my clients had 10 days to move to prevent an eviction. If LL had filed non-payment of rent, my clients could have prevented eviction by paying the rent. These cases are summary proceedings, which for me means if we can't settle, we will immediately go to a bench trial where my only evidence is what my client brings with them. The case had already been adjourned once, and I only met my clients minutes before the hearing was scheduled to start. I made one pitch for a settlement offer, and the landlord basically refused to talk to me, so I had to make my case up on the fly, which might happen in movies, but isn't supposed to happen in real-life practice of law. Thankfully, we were the last case on the docket, and there was a union-mandated lunch break for the court personnel, so we were on the record for only about 10, 15 minutes before we recessed, and I had an hour to come up with a plan. There were no technical problems with the complaint, so my only argument was that the termination was retaliatory. That was a tough case to make, because technically, the law only specifically protects the tenant from retaliation for calling a government agency, which my clients hadn't done. So I'm trying to convince the judge to interpret the law against retaliation broadly. It probably won't work unless I can convince her the real reason the landlord wanted to terminate the tenancy was broader than just non-payment of rent. The landlord brought in his handyman as a witness. His testimony was basically that my tenant's complaint about the property were frivolous and that the house was in good shape. The only good tidbit I got from his testimony was that the furnace was installed incorrectly before he was hired and fixed it. So my client's complaints weren't entirely frivolous, but this was now the middle of summer and the furnace now worked just fine. And now that he was the handyman, according to him, the house was in beautiful shape. I tried cross-examining the repairman and he turned out to be tough for me to control. I'd ask yes or no questions which he'd supplement with very technical explanations for how the furnace worked. He kept saying he took the tenant's complaints personally because he felt they were attacking him personally for doing a poor job. And the reason he wanted to testify was to defend his work. I knew he'd be called to the stand again, but I decided not to cross-examine him any further the second time because he was such a good witness and too hard to control. He foreclosed the possibility of me making the case simply listing the repairs that needed to be made. I didn't feel like it was going well for me until the landlord himself took the stand. The judge posed some questions. Again, this is summary proceedings, so trial procedures are a little different. And to one he said he wanted them gone because he was tired of them always complaining, complaining, complaining. Once he said that I immediately knew I had him. That's what I needed. An admission of his mental state when filed the case. My cross-examination was entirely focused on his frustration with them always complaining about repairs. He hanged himself with his own words. The judge wasn't very sympathetic to him because the landlord has a duty to keep the house in good repair. Because he said on the record that the reason he wanted them out was because they kept asking him to do his job, she held the eviction, was retaliatory in nature, and dismissed the case. Story 32. A friend of my wife was one of the inventors of the technology used for cell phone modems. How you can surf the internet on your cell phone. He and his partners licensed the technology to ATAMPT, which then stole it. They sued and won after getting the lead engineer for ATAMP-T to admit on the witness stand that it was ATAMP-T corporate policy to steal patents from partners, under the theory that they have more money and can outlast the other party in litigation. Story 33. 
defendant here. Where I lived at the time, there were R, very strict statutes involving police having their body cameras on whenever making an arrest due to issues with police brutality, etc., etc. Now, I was getting pulled over and subsequently arrested for a DWI when the reality of the situation was that I was working in the food service industry at the time, coming off of an 18-hour shift, preceded by a 12-hour the day before. I hadn't slept and was tired enough that I shouldn't have been driving, but I was. My wife had picked me up from work earlier. She had a long commute, and I was able to take the bus to work. She would usually pick me up afterwards. And I had gone out afterwards to pick up some beers for my day off the following day. Needless today, failed to follow traffic rules properly, no one was injured, and no accident occurred. But it was just my luck that there was a local PD officer who had seen some swerving and me not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign. Field breathalyzer was negative, but then miraculously the one at the station showed me it somewhere between. 04 and 0 .05, with the legal limit being what it was at the time, was sufficient to get me charged with the DWI, as I also take prescription medication for epilepsy. Naturally, didn't want anything on my otherwise flawless driving record, so I lawyered up the following day. Fast forward to my first hearing, officer at the scene gives his account. My lawyer questions him. Then the actual arresting officer came by with a cruiser. Officer who pulled me over was a motorcycle cop. Doesn't show up for the hearing, evidently having a scheduling conflict. Judge assigns a new date for my lawyer to be able to question the arresting officer. This postponement due to the officer being unavailable happens three more times, which is when my lawyer begins to get super suspicious. He knows something is up. After some digging, my lawyer found out that the local PD had been falsifying their station breathalyzer calibrations, and the machine hadn't been properly calibrated since they received the new machine. The officer who had started the ball rolling on ducking the calibration requirements? You guessed it, the arresting officer on my case. As it turned out, the reason he was unavailable was because he had been placed on administrative leave for the duration of the time it was taking the department to somehow mitigate the damage that would be caused by four years of having an improperly calibrated breathalyzer machine at their station. My lawyer was responsible for getting a bunch of convictions and charges dropped, including mine. And yet, local, conservative media didn't pick up the story, and so it only made it as far as the people who lived in town who heard about it. Thanks again, Bill. You were a kickpeach lawyer. Story 34. There is nothing more satisfying than as a defense lawyer in a bail application getting police to admit that they didn't take any steps to check the obviously unwell suspect's mental and physical health history or obtain treatment once arrested, contrary to the police manual. Actually, anything where police haven't followed basic protocol is fun. The police manual says you must do X, Y, Z. Um, yes. Did you do any of those things? No. But the best moment I've had in court was getting a repeat DFV offender to admit that he was an abusive, violent man who thought he was the victim. Are you an abusive person? No. Were you convicted last year for threatening and abusing fisheries officers? Well, yes. And were you convicted of assault in 2013? Yes. And was the victim of that assault the applicant for this domestic violence order? Fisit. Yes. Do you use threats to control or intimidate people? No. Remember that conviction for threatening fisheries officers, mate? And weren't you just convicted two months ago for breaching a DVO against the applicant on the basis of threatening behavior? Yeah, but that was nonsense, etc. It was so much fun. I don't know why his lawyer thought tendering his prior criminal history would help. Presumably, they thought he didn't have much DFV history. Instead, it gave me a goldmine of cross-examination material, which let me prove he was a habitually violent, threatening, abusive, unpleasant person. Story 35. Custody case. We all knew mom had candy issues, but I was actually asking about another subject at the time, and I brought out a letter she had at some point written to the judge across town begging for her license back, claiming she had gotten sober and cleaned up her life now. This letter was in the public record on the other case. As a complete surprise to me, she freaks out, asking me where I got this letter, claims someone must have broken into her house and stolen her diary, and says, You can't hold that against me. I was high when I wrote that, so yes, if that wasn't clear while she's currently on the stand, swearing to one judge that she's clean and sober. She admits that she recently lied to another judge about being clean sober in an official court document, and apparently was so high she doesn't even remember submitting the letter to the court and accuses me of stealing it from her diary. Story 36. This will get buried in the sand, but when I was in college, I bought a new motorcycle. I didn't yet have a motorcycle license, but I was riding around getting used to the new rocket when I got pulled over. Cop was nice. Let me ride home, but I had a ticket and was bummed. I completely intended to pay the fine and move on and try to find a motorcycle buddy that would ride along to get me to the DMV to get my test done and license in hand. 
I talked to my roommate, who was pre-law and had a father that was a lawyer. He sent a copy to his dad to look at, and his father called asking for me to talk through what happened because he was confused with my ticket. It turned out the university officer that pulled me over wrote me up for driving on a suspended license. When my buddy's dad realized the error, he told me, take it to court and plead not guilty. Then at your court case, don't say anything until towards the very end. Then when the judge asks if you have anything further, say, yes, your honor, I would only like to say that this ticket is for driving under a suspended license, and I can prove my license is not suspended. That's exactly what I did. And since the cop was represented by himself and presumably an intern, they just sat there fumbling through papers, not able to do anything. Finally, and this was the best part, the judge turned to the cop and said, I don't even recall how many times I've had you in this courtroom with erroneous tickets. Get your cow together or find a new job. That, kids, is how I got out of a ticket. Story 37. Not me, but my dad. Back in August of 2010, my aunt, who lives in Florida, had her second stroke and was in a vegetative state. So me, my mom, my dad, and my brother all packed up to go down there and get everything figured out. My mom had power of attorney. It was about an eight-hour drive for us, so we ended up just driving instead of getting plane tickets. When we were near the Georgia-Florida border, we were involved in a really bad accident that ended up with the other car in the air doing barrel rolls. We never hit the other car. They just tried to pass on the right as my dad was changing lanes, and they swerved into the grass and eventually into the air. When this happened, we were in my mom's car. 2006 Chrysler Pacifica piece of cow car. My dad had another car that was in his name a 2003 Ford F-150. The other person involved in the accident was South Korean. Can't remember if she was a diplomat or a student, but she was home in Korea for the court date. The lawyer representing her went on and on asking my dad questions about his truck without realizing that wasn't the vehicle my dad was driving at the time. Whenever the lawyer finished, my dad just asked him, when are we going to talk about the car I was driving at the time of the accident? The judge, confused, asked my dad what he meant. My dad explained the situation to the judge, and the lawyer immediately tried to do damage control. But it didn't really matter. Not sure what the exact decision was. Dad never told me the details because I was still a kid. But our insurance ended up paying very little, if anything at all. Story 38. I was trying a foreclosure case in front of a jury in a very progressive county that hates bank attorneys. I was the bank attorney. Defendant had been evasive and contradictory in depositions when questioned about her basis for not paying her mortgage for several years. Her answers ranged from, I didn't know how, to I paid it off but couldn't show the receipts, so to speak. At trial, I struggled with her on the stand, and I was nervous the jury would just feel sorry for her and find against me out of the kindness of their hearts for this clearly unstable person. I finally got to the part where I asked her about the payments. Not really sure what she would say. This time, she said the mortgage was paid off. I asked who paid them. She said loudly and proudly, My man! I asked who that was, and she said, my attorney said not to say it because it makes me sound crazy, but Barack Obama paid my mortgage. I almost peed my skirt suit. 